NBC10 Boston, and National Grid present Climate 2023. The Earth is changing, getting hotter, faster now than at any point in recorded history. Scientists say the effects will be catastrophic and threaten human life unless we act now to save the planet. Welcome to our third Climate 2023 special. In this half hour, we'll look at the future of heat. I'm Hannah Donnelly. Scientists everywhere are working around the clock investigating greener ways to create energy and ultimately heat our homes. It's the kind of innovation that's top of mind now as we turn up the thermostats to stay warm this winter. It's also a top priority. According to the Rocky Mountain Institute, more than half of American homes rely on gas and other fossil fuels for heating and cooking. So why is that an issue? Fossil fuels like oil, gas, and coal are by far the largest contributor to climate change, accounting for over 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Greenhouse gas emissions like carbon dioxide trap heat in the atmosphere, resulting in higher temperatures and extreme weather. So what can we do? To start, we can seek renewable energy that is more efficient, does not emit carbon, and is ultimately easier on the checkbook. Part of that is electrification, which you might remember from our last special. It's the process of replacing technologies that use fossil fuels with technologies that use electricity as their source of energy. To keep the process carbon neutral, the electricity itself has to come from a green source, like wind or solar. Today, we're continuing the green energy conversation by focusing specifically on home heating. And there are some environmentally friendly methods already in use. One you might have heard of is a heat pump. It's an all-in-one system that heats, cools, and dehumidifies. It can be installed with or without ductwork. It can be pricey up front, but could save you some money on your energy bills in the long run. Heat pumps work by using electricity to power a compressor that then transfers heat indoors. In the summer, it transfers heat outdoors. Think of it as an air conditioner that can also work in reverse. But especially when it comes to capturing energy for heat, there are alternate sources you may not know of that can be renewable if treated the right way. Those include methane, hydrogen, geothermal energy, and more. So let's try to break it all down, starting with methane. Methane is a greenhouse gas that's even more potent than carbon dioxide and is a big contributor to global warming. It comes from oil, gas, and coal mining operations, as well as livestock emissions, some agriculture practices, and the decay of organic materials like food waste. Knowing all of this, it might sound counterintuitive to call methane renewable. However, it can be captured before it gets in the atmosphere. Machines called anaerobic digesters can catch and use the methane in organic waste and even provide some energy for electricity and heat. It's something that Barstow's Longview Farm in Hadley decided to invest in, not only to help the farm stay afloat, but also help the environment and their community. Here's more. Welcome to Barstow's Longview Farm. My name is Denise barstow Mans. I'm part of the seventh generation here on the farm. Our motto here on the farm is looking forward since 1806. So that is our commitment every single day to our herd, our land, our community, and our food system. One of the reasons we wanted to do an anaerobic digester is because it really fits in our community. It was a really big investment. Um, and by working with other dairy farms in our state, we were able to attract the interest of our local legislators um, and also some investors who were interested in this technology on the farm. Anaerobic digesters originally were just on giant uh, pig or dairy farms and running on just manure. Um, and this one is one of the first ones in the country to run also on food waste. Our anaerobic digester takes the energy potential, which is methane, out of cow manure and food waste. So we're getting food waste from local food producers and we're mixing it in with our cow manure in the digester, um, which is a lot like a stomach. We're breaking down all of that food waste, that cow manure, and making a big methane gas burp. So on this farm, um, we're 
converting that methane and we're making that electricity that heads out to the grid um, as a renewable electricity. Um, some anaerobic digesters are uh, on a natural gas pipeline, so they can send it through that. So on our side of the river, we don't have a natural gas pipeline. On some dairy farms, they might be near a natural gas pipeline, and they can just harness that methane and get it right into the, into the line. Heat is one of the waste products of this process. Um, there's a heat recovery unit on the engines. Um, all the houses that are here on the farm have a hot water heater tank. That heated water is coming into our homes heating our houses and then heading back to the digester, like a, a constant loop. So we all have um, hot water, forced hot water in our homes, um, which is you know giving us free hot showers after a long day in the barn, uh, but also heating our homes throughout the winter. Um, and we heat the pool that we have on the farm <laughs> um, for the farm kids in the summertime. This is one of the first ones um, to take that food waste and the technology has only gotten better. Maybe someday we'll all have our own anaerobic digester running in our own homes. It would be amazing to have something like that in our homes, but until then, one way to cut down on methane is to get in the habit of composting. It may not generate heat in your house or apartment, but it will help reduce the harmful gases that come from food waste. There are companies that make it easy by providing composting bins that break down organic materials the right way. Hydrogen is also getting a lot of buzz because it's an efficient energy carrier that can be low or zero carbon. Again, hydrogen is an energy carrier, not an energy source. It can be produced from a number of sources and it can be used for electricity production through a fuel cell, which converts chemical energy into electric energy. When hydrogen is combined with oxygen in a fuel cell, it produces heat and electricity with only water vapor as a byproduct, no carbon. Those fuel cells can provide energy for systems big and small and have no emissions at the point of operation. But to make all of this happen, we need to get to hydrogen in its most pure form without creating carbon emissions. That can be done through steam reform or through electrolysis, also known as water splitting. The steam reform process creates carbon, but eventually removes it. Electrolysis is carbon free, as long as the electricity used is from a renewable source. Since hydrogen is an energy carrier, it can also be used for energy storage. It can be kept for long periods of time, potentially playing a role in managing a renewable powered electric grid. And that could be the wave of the future. Recently, the Biden administration and the Department of Energy announced that seven regional clean hydrogen hubs were selected to receive $7 billion in funding. That will help lay the foundation of a clean hydrogen network. Another exciting type of energy comes from harnessing the heat inside the earth. That's also known as geothermal heat. We'll have more on this after this message from National Grid. National Grid is giving you an upgrade. Here at National Grid, we're the second oldest gas company. And so we have leak probe pipe in the ground for over 200 years. So the company is upgrading their gas main. As we strive to introduce renewable energy and fuel into our homes, the pipes that will carry some of it need to be new too. Our plans are to move to renewable fuels and this will be the pipeline that we can serve our customers. The intent is that this natural gas infrastructure now is going to now fuel renewable fuels such as renewable gas in the future. The plan is to keep focusing on replacing old gas pipes and service lines made of cast iron with newer, stronger, and more durable plastic and steel-coated ones. Right now, the pipes serve natural gas customers, but may leak. Leak-prone pipe is the oldest pipe that's in our natural gas system that's prone to corrosion, weather, leaks at, at the bell and spigot joints. So leak-prone pipe is cast iron, unprotected steel, wrought iron, and older plastic with known issues. National Grid is replacing more than 100 miles of pipe per year with stronger, more durable plastic and coated steel versions. So this is how it works. National Grid will dig trenches, primarily in road surfaces, and lay new pipes block by block. At the end of the day, they will patch the streets to make them passable. 
and then they will come back and repave them all together. So over the next two years, we're going to be evaluating segments of our natural gas system of where we can clip off sections of those systems for full electrification for our customers. National Grid, building a smarter, stronger, cleaner energy future. NBC 10 Boston and National Grid present Climate 2023. Welcome back to Climate 2023, the future of heat. We've been discussing ways to harvest renewable energy to heat homes and buildings. Geothermal well drilling may be an ancient, environmentally friendly way to heat and cool homes. It uses a system that pairs directly with the earth without releasing emissions or greenhouse gases. A geothermal system taps into hot groundwater and depending on the season can heat or cool. The city of Lowell has embraced the technology and partnered with UMass Lowell for a pilot program, actually drilling 600 feet below the school's Wilder Street parking lot on the South Campus. To learn more, we caught up with city manager Thomas Golden Jr. It's really exciting to be working with a great partner like UMass Lowell, a first-class institution, National Grid, who has been a tremendous partner in trying to figure out what the decarbonization goals are for tomorrow. I mean, today's energy uh, concerns uh, is something that every one of us thinks, we all think about this, and we are trying to find out another way to clean up our environment for, you know, my children, grandchildren, and uh, generations to come. This is an exciting opportunity, I think, where the city of Lowell, uh, once again, is looking to be a leader, not just in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but throughout the country. The pilot project is basically a one block area. It goes between four streets in our, in our city, and it's in an environmental justice community. That was something that was very important to us. The network geothermal system is gonna be very similar in when it's constructed, as you would see when they're replacing natural gas pipelines. There will be pipes along the street, and then similar to the natural gas system, you can have systems going into each individual home. That's going to be hooked up to a heat pump in those homes, but instead of moving fossil fuels and natural gas through the pipes, it's going to be moving water so that we have a more renewable type of system for heating in the Commonwealth. National Grid has completed designs for the project and are looking to start construction in the spring around the March-April timeframe with the hope of having all the homes receive their energy efficiency upgrades, any necessary electrical upgrades, getting the new equipment in and having everything ready to go by the next heating season. We are going to take the approach of trying to solve tomorrow's energy problems. And any opportunity that we have to work with somebody like National Grid and UMass Lowell, we're going to take that opportunity. Over the course of the show, we've looked at innovative ways of generating fuel for heat and why it's so important for the future of the planet. We've also discussed how energy is captured and implemented to reach net zero goals. But are these options truly environmentally sound and which are ultimately better for consumers? I asked a panel of experts. Joining me today, Dustin Tingley, a Harvard University professor of government and an expert on climate and energy transition. Next, Darek Malapragada, a principal research scientist with MIT's Energy Initiative. Joe Curtitoni, the president of the Northeast Clean Energy Council. And last but not least, Emerson Claus, senior project manager for Landmark Associates. Thank you guys all for being here today. Thanks for having Great us. to be here. Thanks for having us. So we are talking about renew renewable energy sources. Before we dive into how this impacts the consumer, let's talk about why it's important to even have this conversation. Mm. Well, we can't wait there. Two important reasons. The most, the greatest existential threat of our generation is climate change. And the impacts, the worst case scenario only gets worse with everything we don't do, mm -hmm. or don't address today. Um, but also, there's an incredible opportunity because it is inextricably linked with the opportunity to build an equitable third green industrial revolution. So the, the need to act now and set ourselves up for success and to take on that threat is important and crucial. And so we talked today, we talked about hydrogen, we talked about um, methane, and we talked about geothermal energy. Are these actually good for the environment? Are they, is it, is it as good as it sounds? 
So, so there are parts of the economy where, you know, one of the things we, I, I want to emphasize is there's a lot we can do with electricity and, and replacing the use of fossil fuels with electricity in many parts of the economy, uh, including in our homes and in our cars. But in some use cases, uh, the direct use of electricity to substitute for fossil fuels is going to be challenging. And that's why we need to find molecules that do not produce carbon emissions at the point of use. Uh, and so molecules like hydrogen become really important. And I'd like to stress that you know we have a we have a commercial use case for hydrogen. It's mostly in industry today. We make it from fossil fuels today. Uh, so we have some experience with this molecule in a different context. But now we're trying to sort of do this at a scale and in a way that's carbon free. And that's where the real challenge lies. Yeah, just to build off that, I mean, I think it's really important to find that those nice fits between a particular. Um, technology and how it's actually going to be used. I think mm -hmm. it's so um, tempting to be like, this is the one thing that is going to be the solution for everything. Um, but it's not. Electricity is not going to be the solution for everything. I, you know, I talk about in some of my classes how gasoline is an amazing technology because it's a transporter of energy that you mm -hmm. can put in a tank and you can drive somewhere. Um, but so is electricity and sending it over the wires. Um, but then we have to have the wires. We have to have the grid. We have to have the infrastructure necessary to empower these technologies in order for them to be efficacious. And I think, you know, um, to the mayor's point, sorry, former mayor of Summer, you, you know, <laughs> an icon in my circles, um, you know, and making sure it's equitable, right? Yeah. Because it's going to be very easy for a lot of folks and a lot of communities to perhaps be kind of left behind in some of these conversations. And so finding that right you know, those right combinations and making sure this is an equitable move forward is just going to be really important. But to your question, yes, renewables like, high, uh, like hydropower, mm -hmm. uh, wind, solar, they are good and they work. And we need to continue to be innovative right. and don't dismiss any idea about examining how to process things cleaner without emitting more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. The great thing about solar is you don't have to drill once you put it in. Mm. When, once it's installed, we don't have to drill or, or burn anything to get it done. Or as we're seeing from hydropower come up in Canada, but we need to continue to be innovative in Massachusetts. We lead that globally to examine the next great thing because we need, we're going to need every innovation solution to meet the challenge and be positioned for the next economy. So it's not a one size fits all. No, it, not only is it not a one-size-fits-all, but um, it's very technical information and new technologies. And the end users are worried about one thing pretty much, their utility bill, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, my side from the building industry, if they're not in the market to renovate a home or build a new home, they're not even really paying attention to this other than, you know, maybe some complaints about their power, power bill. Um, so that's the next... Um, one of the challenges to this. The other one would be the workforce that we also have to bring along with these new technologies mm -hmm. and get them trained, put money towards training, and, and have it be able to be installed and, and properly done. So we're, winter is around the corner here in Massachusetts. It's it gets, coming. It gets cold. <laughs> we need to heat our homes. We need to, to, to do that. But in order to do that, there's a high demand. And how a lot of this works, right, is that there's, there's some you know, commentary that the more demand with renewable energy, we don't necessarily have the right storage um, to, to meet that demand. The supply isn't there. So how do we properly store these renewable sources so that in the winter when, when our demand is higher for heating, we can, we can get there? Yeah, so I think, I think the, the reality is that, you know, there's, there's a portfolio of energy storage technologies that are on the market today, some, you know, ready to deploy today, some, some sort of in, in, in the stage of development, and hydrogen's one of them. I wouldn't say hydrogen's the silver bullet, it's got its own challenges, uh, but certainly when it comes to thinking about storing energy for long periods of time, uh, we know how to store energy in the form of molecules. We do that today. We store lots of natural gas. We store it in the summer, and then we use it in the winter, right? And so it, there is some analogies there that, that become relevant, but there's a lot of other solutions on the table that we can use to manage this supply-demand mismatch, which includes, you know, uh, setting up our electricity retail rates such that we encourage consumers to use more electricity at certain times and charge their cars at certain times and not charge their cars at other times and build transmission lines to Canada, use yeah. the, the winter resources. The, the storage piece, I think, you know, it, taking a step back, um, you know, how do we store most of our energy right now beyond the sort of molecule side, which is hydrogen, gasoline? This, this, um, it's uh, pumping water up a hill. Right. The vast majority of, of, of pumped of, of storage of renewable sources come literally from gravity. Right. right. We pump water up a hill and then when we need the energy, we let it flow down the hill, then 
turn a generator so, or t- turbine and whatnot. So, and then, you know, there's a range of other things, like compressed air. People are thinking about that. How do we, and, and what's nice about those things, those things can easily generate electricity, but they, they take land, um, you know, all of these things. So it's a, it's a complicated equation. Mm-hmm. I also think it's not just storage. It's also, and you were hinting at this, it's also how do we build out the grid so that we can get enough electricity in. So we're looking at something where if we are electrifying our homes, you know, heat pumps, these sorts of things, and in the winter, we're going to start to see peak um, usage during the winter. We used to be peaking during the summer, right? And great about the summer, we had lots of solar online. Mm-hmm. We're not going to have that anymore. So all of a sudden, we're going to be winter peaking. We don't have the grid to get in the electricity. We don't have necessarily the distribution. How are we going to get all the electricity needed into Somerville right. to do this? That's right. going to be a challenge. This is important because when people see exciting you know, vineyard wind coming out of the ground, we've permitted wind projects or solar projects. We think, well, great, we're on our way. We have to get that to you as the end user to be the easy, equitable, sustainable, affordable choice. So what the federal government's doing with the IRA and Build Back Better, what the state is doing, investing in infrastructure, that means we need to be able to store that energy to take demand off the grid, transmit it to your homes. We need interconnection Mm -hmm. uh, among the states. We live in one of the most provincial parochial states, 351 cities and towns doing their own thing. And the same thing across New England. That is important. And across the Northeast, where my members, uh, we represent from New England, uh, around New England and New York State, that is a big topic for the governors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll just flag that, you know, today we use only one-fifth of all the energy we use shows up in the form of electricity. We use a lot of molecules to sort of power mm-hmm. our lives. Uh, and we want to make that, you know, double or, you know, go to 50% or 60% of our all energy being electricity, right? So that's a, that's a massive mm-hmm. increase in the grid. Mm-hmm. Um, but that comes with all these other infrastructure deployments that we have to do. So the real balancing act here is, we have to build all this infrastructure, which means somebody has to pay for this infrastructure. So how do we then distribute the cost such that we don't create a disincentive for us to use electricity, right? If we just stick it to everybody's bill such that it's on a kilowatt hour basis, then you're going to create a strong disincentive for people to use. So really sort of thinking about the cost, but the cost allocation problem is really, I think, a key piece here. So another part of the storage um, that I see, again, back at the ground level, is that we now see with battery storage, people wanting to put it in their house, in their garage, and we're seeing maybe lack of information that the building officials have or fire departments have, they're afraid of it, they're putting roadblocks in the way. And so again, I get back to workforce training and development, and that includes those officials, Mm -hmm. because as the mayor mentioned, 351 different communities, they all have a different idea how, I know because I pull permits in a bunch of them, it's a different game in each one of them. So we have to get that info in their hands, get them trained so they're not afraid that I want battery storage to go with my solar. And, and you know, and, and that's, that's got to come with it. Yeah. And the workforce piece is a huge opportunity. I mean, so yeah. I'm an educator, so like maybe, maybe having you know, folks in class is a, is a challenge for them. But th- this is an opportunity. These are new skills. These are new ideas. This is a new economy. And that's why I think I'm very optimistic about some of this, because this is, yeah. this is gonna, these are new jobs. They're going to be well-paying, hopefully. And I think that's a, that's a good story. This well, is important yes. because uh, yeah, clean sorry. energy jobs, that's right, are outpacing fossil fuel jobs. That's mm. really a result of machination in the fossil fuel industry. We've seen an exponential historic investment in clean energy, climate tech companies. Massachusetts, if you draw an oval shape from Boston Metro to New York Metro and even up towards Maine, that is the, the leader globally, the catalyst region. And we talk about the president's hydrogen plant. Can you guys talk about that and why that's a, a good example? Having a goal is really laudable, and you know the federal government supports through the Investment uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, is is a real sort of big boost for the industry. Um, and so I think we need to be able to see that this actually works in different settings. Have these hydrogen hubs, which are which are un, in, under deliberation now, actually manifest so that we can actually see. How do you make the hydrogen? How do you store it? How do you move it? Who's going to, you know, what are the best end uses? I, 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 there's one risk that I worry about uh, a lot, which is we use hydrogen for things we don't need to use hydrogen for. Yep. Uh, you know, where, yep. you know, you could do, you could do it better with electricity. Okay. Uh, and so sort of trying to find that balance where, you know, hydrogen is a very expensive molecule to make. So we want to be very careful about using it where we think uh, we really don't have other options. Our electrifi- electrification doesn't work, right? And then so these hubs are going to be a real good example to demonstrate at scale across different parts of the country using nuclear energy, using yeah. renewables, using natural gas with carbon capture in different jurisdictions and, and trying to sort of demonstrate 
that you know there's different forms of how a hydrogen economy can be developed in different regions uh, for different use cases. Right? Yeah. So, there's plenty of examples whether nationally and even regionally. So if you want to go to Maine where they've already uh, installed 100,000 heat pumps with the state back and pushing that with incentives, they're about to get to 175,000. Massachusetts is moving that direction. But we have companies right here in Mass that are global presence mm -hmm. that are doing these things. We have vicinity energy that has a district energy plant that powers all the many of the universities and hospitals in Greater Boston taking natural captured heat from within the Charles River. Mm -hmm. So there are examples there. It absolutely works. It works. Yeah. Can we talk about um, methane and geothermal energy and how we harness mm -hmm. those those yeah, so, so, so I mean we use we use lots of methane in the economy today, right? The, the challenge is that's, that's fossil methane, and when we burn it, we produce carbon emissions, right? So there's a lot of, uh, the reason we have sort of adopted the methane um, utilization across sectors of our economy is because it provides certain compelling characteristics. It's a dense fuel, it can be piped relatively easily, right? So those attributes still remain valuable in certain contexts, but the real challenge is can we make that methane using hydrogen, using renewable carbon sources in a way that is you know, uh, beneficial for from a climate perspective, right? So it has greenhouse gas benefits rather than greenhouse gas adverse impacts. And, today. and I think it's really important to understand a couple things about about methane, mm -hmm. natural gas, if you will. Um, you know, if you're burning it, it's producing carbon dioxide, but there's a lot of methane leakage, mm -hmm. right? And this is a huge challenge. Right. It's a challenge in our area, and the problem with methane leakage is that produces a really climate forcing, really fast effect on the climate. It heats up things fast, much faster than carbon dioxide, right? And so mm -hmm. if we're leaking methane, even though it's a little bit cleaner when we burn it than say oil, that's a huge problem. I like geothermal energy for a variety of reasons. First of all, it's just really neat that we could harvest heat from inside the earth yeah. um, and leverage it. But is it going to be a sort of, you know, a solution for everything? Absolutely not. But there's a lot of innovation that's happening. There's some um, work going on here in Massachusetts about um, how do we use a sort of community geothermal mm -hmm. um, as one mechanism. There's also, you know, big um, geothermal opportunities out west, right? And so, you know, the state of California and Nevada, and how are we gonna power all these data centers that are popping up everywhere? Geothermal has some really nice characteristics right. uh, in different geographies um, and use cases. So, you know, that's something that, you know, I think is, needs to be part of the conversation, and it, conversation and, and as well. I'll, I'll, I'll add just two points to that. One is on the geothermal side, it leverages some of the you know, the skill sets and the engineering workforce from the oil and gas industry, because we're talking about- Pipes, you gotta drill. You have to drill. There's some novel <laughs> technologies there, you know, such as enhanced the thermal, where you can essentially kind of store the heat intermittently and then kind of pull it out as you need it. Okay. Uh, so it becomes a really compelling for, prospect. For, for residential cases, my friend here knows the best, though, you know, a single house doing a geothermal well. I know it is. Cost prohibitive. Yeah. Cost prohibitive, so, right? So there's a lot that we can do. So thank you guys all for taking the time today to help um, educate us. Oh, thank, thank you, thank you for, for, having us. for having us. Thanks again to our panelists. And thank you for watching Climate 2023, The Future of Heat. I'm Hannah Donnelly. See you next time.